Thank you um, for joining us today. So today we have two faculty from the uh, from Penn State and they're going to talk to us about very exciting research they have been doing. So with us we have Brian Wolfgang and Dr. Ali Namari. So if you can each kind of introduce yourself and your role at Penn State, please. Maybe sure, Brian, you can go first. Sure. Well, it's an honor to be here. My name is Brian Wolfgang. I'm the, so the Associate Director of the Pennsylvania Housing Research Center. Uh, this is an organization that's a part of the Civil Engineering Department at Penn State. And our primary role is outreach directly to the residential construction industry in the Pennsylvania region and the surrounding regions. So the, the majority of my time is spent outside of the walls of the university, but uh, we structured our program in a way that brings together that industry connection with some of the academic programming that we have at Penn State. So that uh, re really builds a nice bridge and connection for our students and our research directly to our industry. Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Mimari. Yes, uh, Ali Memory, I'm a faculty here in the Department of uh, Architecture, Engineering and Civil Engineering, uh, kind of joint appointment. And uh, uh, my position has the uh, Hankin Chair for Residential Construction and also the Director of Pennsylvania Housing Research Center. Uh, so as a faculty, uh, I'm involved in uh, teaching some courses and also uh, a lot of research projects that maybe we'll get a chance to talk mm -hmm. about those and also uh, administer uh, a uh, residential construction program for students, basically education program. Uh, this is at the uh, uh, bachelor's level because the courses are bachelor, but then the research is at the master's and PhD level. These days, a lot of PhD students actually are doing the research in this area. So uh, as I guess the conversation uh, develops, you know, I can add uh, any part that you have an interest in more discussions. OK, thank you very much. Um, so first, um, I know there is a lot of talk about research in construction. So in your opinion, Dr. Mimari, how do you define research in the construction field? Uh, well, this is a general, general question then, uh, because research then depends on, on the, the area within the construction. You could be talking about uh, construction methods, construction techniques, you could be talking about construction material, to be talking about construction systems, uh, and then uh, going to the uh, actual construction, you know, is it buildings, uh, residential versus commercial, and then non-building? So it's it's broad, it's a broad question, but I guess uh, uh, since this is more related to residential, so we focus on residential construction, uh, research uh, is needed to uh, kind of expand uh, the uh, the abilities and the technologies that we have. Uh, you know, in if you look at homes that uh, have been around for over a hundred years, right? They're uh, they're there, they're they're standing, they're doing well, sort of. And uh, and so the technique that has been used to build these homes, uh, basically wood framing and maybe a little concrete floor, uh, the, the, the ground floor, and then maybe some basement, uh, roofing, siding. So the technology has not advanced significantly, but the materials have advanced somewhat. Like uh, maybe in the old days you had uh, wood siding, now we have vinyl siding. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, uh, in the old days you had just one uh, single light, uh, glass window here today we have double pane glass maybe more insulation uh you know shingles and then uh, uh maybe they were just uh, regular uh, shingles maybe wood shingles now you have uh, i guess uh, tar based shingles so there are advancements gradually in the uh in the components that mm -hmm. we attach to a building uh, but essentially it has remained pretty much the same wood framing is the essential construction system. And so research then is needed uh, to go beyond that. And the first question is why, why do we need to do mm -hmm. research? Why do we have to go beyond that? Well, I, I guess it comes down to uh, uh, is, is wood framing the way we have been building for, uh, I guess, hundreds of years. Is it, is it okay just mm -hmm. to stick to that or should we go beyond that? Well, it, it really depends on where you live. Some areas, it's just fine. You know, it, it does well. There's plenty of wood around. 
So why why should you go to make it uh, with uh, concrete? But in other areas, uh, you know, it doesn't do well. Let's say if you're in flood regions, if you're in hurricane mm -hmm. areas, if you're in tornado regions, if you're in uh, uh, maybe East Coast, uh, if you have to spend a lot of uh, 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 money on fuel to warm up the house, the wood framing is not going to do well. So there are then, uh, we have to search for other possibilities. That means, what are the materials that we can use to build walls? And uh, what are the uh, basically layers that go into that wall to make the wall uh, not only safe uh, as far as the loading is concerned, like you have high wind, maybe uh, a storm, uh, but also uh, thermal, thermally insulated, mm -hmm. uh, and also moisture resistant. That these days you have, uh, uh, you know, the, the the vapor that that can uh, accumulate in within the wall. If if we do the wall, uh, sometimes we we jump at a new idea. Let's say wallpaper is beautiful, makes the interior nice. Mm -hmm. You put the wallpaper on your drywall, makes it nice. But then you forget that it's going to trap actually the uh, the vapor inside uh, because there will be condensation. Yeah, so that means uh, uh, we might use a material a layer that we think is good because it looks good, but it could actually cause some problems. So we have to learn uh, how the, these different uh, layers within a building wall and then different uh, forces like vapor mm -hmm. force, thermal force, uh, air leakage, all of those affect the performance of these layers. The, see, in the old, uh, in the old days, you had just wood frame, no insulation inside. You had the wood siding on the outside, and inside perhaps you had plaster. That mm -hmm. was it. So it worked well. I mean, it would if any humidity will pass through, it will dry out. Uh, you're not going to get any mold there in the old homes. I mean, a lot of them actually didn't have insulation. So now, as you start adding more layers, insulation, uh, you know, vapor barrier, air barrier, siding, wallpaper, paint. All of that uh, are are uh, basically the the reasons that we get some condensation in the uh, in the walls, and then of course that would lead into mold growth. Mold growth can make people sick. Mm -hmm. If people have asthma, it it worsens their condition. So that means we've we've tried to make advancement in building walls uh, with newer material, but sometimes we just uh, use them without clearly and deeply understand the implications and their side effect. So that means then you ask, why do we need research? Well, the answer is that with all these issues, do we need research or not? You mm -hmm. see, we need research. So that means we need research. We need to understand, uh, use the science. Uh, we call it building science. In this uh, realm, uh, building science, that means the heat, air, moisture effect on the performance of the walls, because then it has an effect on the habitat, in the, it had, on the occupants. The occupants' health and comfort is really related to how the walls and windows all work together. And at the same time, uh, you know, do we want to pay high energy bill at the end of the mm -hmm. month? We don't want to do that. So that, then you're, you're dealing with, okay, how do we do the energy efficiency? Uh, where, is, where is the heat loss occurring? Okay, uh, is it through the window? Is it through the wall? Is it through the roof? So then... Uh, and then what about the system that is uh, providing the heat inside the home? Can we make advancement on those? So that means all of these things have to now work in tandem. That means your HVAC has to work in tandem with your window. Now we have what's called passive house. Passive house is a new development in the home building, right? Well, it's, uh, you know, if, if you look at it, the home looks the same. It doesn't yeah. look too much different. But it is the uh, when you look at the details, maybe you have more insulation, maybe it's airtight. So, do we need testing? Yes. So, do we, we do a, a blower door test. That means we, we want to see how airtight the house is because it makes a difference. Now, if you make the house, on the other hand, see, we may choose and use some uh, new concept, new technology, but on the other hand, we may be damaging ourselves. So, mm -hmm. if you make a house too airtight, and if it cannot breathe, it cannot dry out, then obviously you've provided the opportunity for mold to growth and cause some more problems. So, so that's why we need to do research all the time. 
we are in search of new materials, new systems that will help uh, the building the homes not only to be more energy efficient, healthier, resistant to the environmental effects, the wind effect, storm effect, uh, and uh, for now, let alone tornado and earthquake, because they can just. <laughs> if, if we talk, problem. Yeah, that's a different problem. But then uh, flood effects. So, so there are a lot of uh, issues for a, just a normal house under the normal environmental condition, not the hazard not the mm -hmm. extreme conditions. Uh, so that's why we need a lot of research. That's why we need to have research on materials. Uh, there are obviously a lot of interest in uh, making a building so that at the end of the day, uh, the homeowner does not have to pay so much for the mm -hmm. energy bill, right? So that the, 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 the home feels uh, healthy. It doesn't feel wet and smuggy and, and because mm -hmm. people get sick and and all of that is what we put in it and also how we predict the behavior of the user occupant if we put something here and we think that the occupant oh well it's their responsibility to follow the instructions for this system for this system of let's say window or system mm -hmm. of air conditioning system well guess what they are not going to follow that <laughs> You know, uh, let's say you have uh, you have. Uh, I mean, we hear a lot of things about the washer and dryer, right? Mm -hmm. That okay, we make it so efficient, but then you don't uh, you don't control your kids. Let's say your teenagers, they they throw in just one pair of jeans and they run this thing. So, well, are you are you really saving money? So it's the behavior of the occupant has to be tied in. So in that sense, then you want to make things that are somewhat independent of the behavior or have controls for the behavior so that the design will work. I said the example of passive house, if if you have air leakage mm -hmm. in your in your house and you've designed this house as passive house, well, it's not going to work because yep. it has to be airtight. Uh, if you leave the windows open all the time, <laughs> that's not going to work. So uh, as far as the uh, the material that goes, uh, you know, we want to make sure the materials are now sustainable. The, mm -hmm. the, the, the basis, the basic material that we find to use, we want to make them sustainable. Uh, you know, yes, you can use, uh, you know, bath insulation, but then uh, people can argue, say, well, look, this is, this is a lot of chemicals. This is not a natural material. Why not these days use like hempcrete? You know, hemp mm -hmm. is a very natural material. It's bio-based, it's healthy. Uh, so now, now we have started to kind of look at uh, well, maybe, maybe, the, maybe they got a point. Maybe we have to find bio-based materials too, uh, to for insulation. Uh, what about paints? What about uh, the walls are made of uh, uh, studs, right? So what about making them out of concrete? Mm -hmm. like out of concrete, yes, it's, it's a good idea. Making them sturdy, strong, but then using cement, which is a is a bad buzzword these days, right? Because yeah. it's associated with CO two. <laughs> So that means the carbon footprint for the whole building has to be minimized. And you can't use cement in the concrete. So now we start thinking about, OK, well, if we agree that the concrete is a good material to use, but we don't want cement, so we have to look for alternative to cement. And so there is research again here that okay. we're trying to make uh, maybe uh, CO2 negative or carbon negative, at least carbon neutral. You know, these you, you can't say low carbon. <laughs> these days. It's just not, not not acceptable anymore. You get either neutral or carbon negative. So that means we're we're pushing the envelope toward the materials that at the end of the day. But then you say, okay, how do I know that all of this will actually work? We say, well, you got to look at the uh, life cycle assessment. That mm -hmm. that so you get the LCA. Now you hear this buzzword LCA all the time. That's where the uh, that's what the bean counting is. That means uh, so you put all of these things in. How do you how do you know that uh, it's going to work? And at the end, it has uh, it has lower carbon footprint. Uh, well, they do the calculation. We have to do the modeling. And then even people go beyond that. They say, well, if you're really really looking at uh, 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 you know sustainability in the sense from uh, from let's say. Uh, the birth to the to the death, whatever you know. Uh, then you have to look at 
where do you end up when the house is demolished? Yeah. Right. How do you how do you get rid of a house get a building? Well, then you have to also account for the energy that is used to actually get rid of that. And what do you do with the material? You put in the landfill. Mm -hmm. uh, is it going to hurt the landfill? Is it going to hurt the ground, the water sources that we have? What if there's leaching of uh, chemicals? So, so you see, then everything needs to be researched. Uh, and that's why the research uh, area is wide open. And, uh, and our program is geared toward a lot of these areas, but with a relative focus on residential. You know, what at the mm -hmm. end, at the end of the day, if our efforts uh, kind of help uh, advancing the state of the art and the state of the technology in residential construction, I think we've done our job. That, that's great. That's actually very like encompassing answer to show the breadth that you know, researching construction is, and it's not simple. And that's why we need to do research. You know, you have to consider all these factors. So I find it very interesting. Um, now to follow up, in your opinion, how partnerships between universities and industry can move the construction industry forward? Oh, it's, it's, it's an absolute necessity. I mean, uh, uh, it's just, if we if we uh, sit here as the, at the university and just uh, work uh, uh, research in the laboratory and write papers, uh, yes, you know the industry might uh, might see a paper and maybe uh, they they will be interested. But if you really want to get something out there, you got to work with the industry. You got to see what their needs are, what their interests are, and and form the collaboration. In particular, what we do in, in at university is uh, like a research scale, lab scale, right? I can make a unit small, test it in my machine, but then if you want to build a wall that is uh, real size and you want to have a production scale, then you need to have a manufacturer that actually would be interested in this. So the collaboration is, is necessary. We do uh, like a small scale testing in at the university laboratories. And then if the collaborator industry is interested to invest in that area and make uh, products that are real sized, then sometimes we send them to laboratories uh, that are professional like Intertech. Uh, you know, they, 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 these, uh, these laboratories are uh, certified for many different ASTM testing. And so they can, uh, they can do sample tests and, and give you a rating of maybe of the performance of the product that you're trying to uh, figure out. Uh, as an example, let's say if you have a window uh, that is supposed to, uh, I mean, you probably have seen these uh, uh, these pictures that they throw a two by four toward a window mm -hmm. uh, for mm -hmm. to hurricane resistant, yep. tornado resistant. That that's probably stands out from all these labs. And and so what it means is that yes, you need to have a window that will survive. Uh, you know, when you uh, shoot a, from an air cannon a two by four, and and it should not break. So if it breaks, that means it doesn't pass. Or if you're in a, a, a earthquake regions, then we have a different kind of rating. So, so what it means is that at the university level, in, in our laboratories, we do small scale testing. We try to come up with the material characterization. And then if the manufacturer is willing to produce and invest in that uh, area, then of course we have to go to a professional or certified lab to make sure that things are according to the ASCM standards. So it's, it's very clear that it's very applied research. It's something that is probably, hopefully, marketable in the future. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, the other thing I was going to say was mm -hmm. that uh, um, there is a, a lot of uh, interest in in you know when we talk about energy efficiency, hand in hand goes with sustainability. Mm -hmm. And we asked somebody, how do you define sustainability? <laughs> You know, 10, 10 people will have 10 different <laughs> definition of sustainability because, you know, uh, it's, it's just a matter of uh, in what context we're going to define yep. it. So uh, sustainability, let's say if we have a, a, a house that, you know, it's, you know, uh, hopefully it will be up there for about 100 years, end of life. What, what happens at the end of life? You have to also consider that in the sustainability. Uh, so that means 
part of the movement in sustainability is reuse of materials. You know, we say we trash them. We don't want to trash, right? Trash goes in the landfill. Well, how about not sending them in the landfill? How about finding a different use for them? Mm -hmm. Like concrete. We're just working on a uh, proposal, actually some projects right now, that the concrete that is used, and after the, let's say they, they employ a building or they break it apart, we say, okay, that concrete should not go in the landfill. Let's bring it here. We'll use it again because we can crush it and use the chunks as as your aggregate, right? Mm -hmm. so that, that means you have you have just reused the same the same material that was was a building at a time, um, or plastics. So I mean, we have millions and millions and tons of plastics are being uh, produced, and what is the end of life of plastics? Well, <laughs> what do you do with them? Some countries actually throw them in oceans, yeah. and that has caused a lot of problems. Some countries dump them in the landfill. Now, the problem with that is that they're not going to break down. Plastics will not break down. That means they stay there. They're going to contaminate over time. And there's going to be a lot of problems. So again, we come here and say, OK, well, uh, you've heard of uh, rigid foam. We love rigid foam, right, for insulation. I mean, Brian loves rigid foam. He loves these uh, insulation materials. Uh, and so we say, OK, why not make the rigid forms out of the recycled plastics? Why, why, why throw away the recycled plastic in the uh, in the landfill or in the ocean? Let's bring them back here, and we make a rigid foam out of that recycled plastics. Why not bring some of the recycled plastics, bring them and mix them in concrete? Right? If you mix them in concrete instead of the aggregate, hmm. guess what happens? Your concrete actually is going to be a little more flexible. It bends without hmm. cracking. I mean, wouldn't I you like not concrete? Know that. There you go. So, so you see, we can we can do research to change the 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 conventional things that we used to make them even better, but being sustainable. So again, that's you know you define sustainability in different contexts. That is some other examples. Very good. So, I know you've mentioned a lot of hot topics, but if you could narrow down perhaps to the top two or three hot topics that you see uh, that are hot topics of research to help improve the construction industry, what would be the kind of the top ones? Again, with the construction, we're talking about the homes, residential construction. Mm -hmm. um, well, th there are uh, several that are moving. One is I have to mention is the modular Mm -hmm. construction. That means instead of uh, building at the job site, which has a certain uh, uh, season time, let's say if you're building in the colder regions, <laughs> let's just forget about Alaska. You know That doesn't count. But if you're building, uh, let's say, in, uh, you know, here in P Pennsylvania or, or northeast, I guess from, uh, I mean, Brian is, is, is in a better position to, to answer that, but probably from, I don't know, December through March or uh, April, maybe four or five months, it's very difficult to work under those conditions. Yes. Okay, so so then um, we say, why not modular? That means you assemble this whole thing in a factory, in large, work, big, big uh, box buildings or warehouses under factory conditions. Your workers are safer. Uh, it's not going to take a whole lot of time. Uh, and then you you ship these uh, these units to the job site. You assemble them. So modular construction is becoming more of a notice for single family. Now the story with multifamily is different. Uh, you see, there was a kind of stigma about uh, about this modular home. We call it modular mm -hmm. home, but in the old days we used to call them mobile homes. Had a not a good stigma or a stigma was not good about mobile homes. So we've kind of tried to move away from that. We call them manufactured homes. Now, uh, then the uh, the whole construction of these uh, manufactured homes has advanced so much that you can put a lot of advanced technologies in this. And because you are building them within a factory, actually you're putting much more technology for the same price. OK, and at, and, and at the end of the day, it, it, it takes less time to construct. So that means, let's say if you are uh, you're developing a uh, a campus, uh, maybe a, a factory and you want to have homes for the workers in nearby. OK, 
that that manufactured homes is the best solution because quickly you can have several factories build these homes for you, ship them, erect them. Within just a few months, you have the whole uh, area, the whole neighborhood developed. So, uh, and also multifamily, and it goes multi stories. Mm -hmm. You can have these units; these are like cubicle. You can stack them, attach them permanently, and when you look from outside. You can't tell this was a, like a manufactured, uh, like a, a modular. We call it modular in that sense. It's, not, it's a modular home. You can't tell that once it's dressed up. So modular then is one area of advancement because you can make a lot of technologies, put a lot of technology in them. Uh, the other one that is uh, ex has created a lot of excitement, uh, going back to wood. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we talked about the, uh, the studs that, you know, two by four studs or two by six studs that, I mean, this is how we build homes, but uh, we've discovered that actually if the, if you stack these uh, two by fours and two by sixes and two by tens, whatever, in cross direction, you make a laminated kind of panel out of that, then uh, you get what we call it cross laminated timber. Mm -hmm. in, in general, they consider mass timber yeah. or they call them CLT. CLT has, has, has created a lot of excitement. Uh, so we build, uh, and they they were initially proposed for uh, multi-family buildings, like multi-family apartment buildings or multi-story buildings, but not too tall, like less than 10, 10 stories. Yeah. But we are thinking that actually, you know, a lot of custom homes can be made out of uh, CLT. So we started in our uh, center some work toward uh, bringing CLT actually to residential, single family residential. So uh, uh, CLT then is is a name to remember because mm -hmm. it's growing and there's a lot of excitement about its use. Uh, and one reason is that obviously it's wood, so no, everybody loves wood. The only concern that people had, if you talk about it, like a ten-story building out of wood, they say, "Oh, wait a minute, wait yeah. a minute, do I want to live in that building? Really? Uh, fire is is uh, a scare, something scary." But the good news is that when you make these woods so thick. Uh, the exterior layers, if they burn, they become charred, and then that kind of protects the rest of the uh, uh, the rest of the, uh, the section. So, so there has been a lot of uh, work done, a lot of research done, to prove that okay, well, even if you have a regular building like made of concrete or steel, you have drywalls. Uh, the the criteria is that well, if you make the uh, you know burn for one hour, if it gives you one hour time to get people out, then you're okay. Well, guess what? The CLT does that. So that means, okay, so if you can make it meet the same criteria, that's the thing. You meet the criteria for the performance, even under fire. If you make it work, then you say, why not going with CLT? So CLT has started to cause a lot of uh, excitement, interest. Mm -hmm. uh, other areas, I would say new materials that are coming about. Uh, we have, uh, our team has actually, uh, started to work on uh, what we call it hempcrete. Again, mm -hmm. it's a bio-based, it's an industrial hemp. We started to do some research on that to bring it to for home building uh, since 2017, which was illegal at the time, but in 2018, it became legal to grow it. So we were a little bit ahead of the curve, uh, kind of uh, saying, okay, let's, let's, let's find out about this material and let's try to use it for home construction. It is becoming very big now. Uh, a lot of interest in hempcrete. Uh, we built, uh, we helped build or, or retrofit the first uh, hempcrete house in Pennsylvania in Newcastle. Uh, Dawn Services was the uh, is the owner, and they basically uh, raised some money to 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 basically uh, uh, develop a neighborhood, a very poor neighborhood in Newcastle. Uh, by uh, they they basically buy these uh, very cheap homes. And they they refurbish them. They get loans from banks, refurbish them, and then they sell them to people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. So they're doing a, such a great job, and we're proud of that. Uh, we had the opportunity to work with them. But the point being that hempcrete, you're basically uh, getting the uh, uh, getting the, the the stock of of the the hemp plant, and and you chop it. You take the uh, fibers out. You chop them. You make them small, and then you mix them with lime. So you have a uh, you have what's called hempcrete. Actually, I have uh, a uh, a piece here because this is a very active uh, research, and I have a lot of meetings. So this is uh, hempcrete when it's made. Actually, it's a block. Okay, it's a block of hempcrete. This is hemp as it is uh, is shaved off the plant, 
Okay. So okay. that's that's that. These are this. So this is looks like a uh, looks like your fiber insulation. That's actually insulation material. And not only that, you can uh, you can actually make a wood out of it. So uh, make a wood flooring. So this is uh, this is hemp. We call it hemp wood. It's laminated. And I'm just uh, it happened that I'm uh, discussing with a company that actually they want to do some research on this material for uh, for flooring. So yes, go ahead. Uh, so the the hemp crete has no cement. No, has it has lime. We use lime instead of cement. Okay. Okay. Very yeah. interesting. But the, the 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 only point is that first of all, the advantage is that very light. It's one maybe one uh, ten one fifth the weight or maybe one to one tenth. I'm sorry, one tenth the weight of concrete, and it is uh uh it is uh, it is very weak though. It's not as strong as concrete. It's actually maybe one tenth the strength of concrete. But we're not using it as a block yet. We're using it as insulation. So that means if you have a wood frame and you fill that space and beyond the, 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 the edges of the framing with hempcrete and then put your uh, maybe drywall or maybe a, a line, uh, maybe a, put, a, put a coat of lime on the very exterior uh, and then maybe on the outside you can put either wood siding or uh, regular siding. Then you have a you have a wall that the first of all you haven't used any chemicals because mm -hmm. bath insulation you know lots of chemicals that you get a lot of off gassing sometimes uh, make people sick. It's a very natural material, fireproof. It doesn't burn. That means if you take a flame, uh, you put this on the flame, it's not going to burn. So that's that's one of the things about this uh, this material. So. Hempcrete then is another area of uh, interest that uh, a lot of people have shown interest in that area. Uh, the other thing that we are uh, talking about uh, building homes is passive house standard. That's a hot, very hot topic. Uh, the only thing is that uh, when you say passive house, it's really the uh, the combination of things that go in there. It's not one thing. So for instance, windows, they have to be sometimes triple pane. Mm -hmm. uh, your HVAC has to be extremely efficient. The air tightness have to be, has to be done very accurately, and then you 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 would have to do actually testing to prove that your air leakage is minimum, maybe 0.5. Brian, is that right? 0.5 uh, uh, air change per hour, something like that, less than one. So right. uh, so you need to have uh, metrics that mm -hmm. actually meet in order to say. This house is built based on <clears throat> passive house standard, and we uh, we were probably one of the first uh, universities that uh, have put together and offer a course in in passive house. These are some examples of some advancements in in home construction that uh, require research and is is still really ongoing. Those are those are great topics for the students who are watching to kind of dig deeper and do their own research and see what's going on and just stay tuned probably. Uh, so now how about we talk about one one project that you think kind of represents you well. Uh, if you can briefly describe it and there, you know, I, I want to understand a little bit more maybe on the motivation, industry involvement and some of the basic results of that project. Well, I mean, it's difficult to point pinpoint one project because we have multiple uh, very exciting and interesting projects that uh, we're we're proud of. First of all, uh, I'm proud of uh, our uh, team here at uh, at Penn State, the PHRC, providing excellent support, and then of course our graduate students. I mean, I'm so proud of them. Each one of them, uh, we uh, we provide opportunities for them to do research. Uh, in the in the old days. There wasn't a whole lot of uh, like uh, you talk to faculty 30 years ago, uh, you know, they had probably difficulty bringing somebody to do research on residential buildings because the vision was, OK, what do I research? But now with all the topics that I have discussed, you see there is a lot of research ideas. So students are very excited to get involved. But uh, be beyond the uh, the materials that we've talked about and the systems and energy efficiency, et cetera, we also look at uh, Homes that need to be built in areas that could be subjected to extreme loading conditions. So, for instance, uh, hurricane, mm -hmm. tornadoes, a flood. So, I have some some students of mine are have been working and are working on. Let's say, what if you have to build homes uh, in uh, uh, in Florida, 
uh, in Haiti, in uh, Puerto Rico, that are supposed to uh, survive hurricane, flood, and earthquake. It's it's a combination of a combination of uh, uh, n natural hazards that uh, is very difficult to deal with. But those are areas that we have focused on. We just submitted a proposal to NSF uh, to uh, look at homes for Puerto Rico where they they their homes are elevated because of the flood, uh, but then uh, they become uh, uh, vulnerable to earthquakes. Like if you elevate a home, you <laughs> earthquake on top you of that. You create another problem. That's right. That's right. You make, you make yourself vulnerable mm -hmm. to another hazard. Uh, if they're built on ground, there's less hazard. But you elevate that on very skinny columns, then then it can topple. So we just put uh, a proposal to NSF to look at uh, this problem and try to come up with some solutions for them. So extreme uh, extreme loading conditions and how to uh, come up with home designs that would that would address those issues. That's one one area. Uh, I think. Uh, uh, the, our hempcrete uh, research project is is very exciting. A lot of interest in that. The CLT uh, research that uh, we're designing homes. When we started to look at CLT application for homes, there really weren't a whole lot of references. So we've developed some documents and uh, some uh, R and D work that uh, you know we're publishing the results in uh, journal papers, in research reports, in chapters of books that others can actually pick up and, and use. Uh, we're working on uh, concrete materials that are uh, uh, sort of uh, CO2 free in the process of building them. That means carbon negative uh, or, or carbon neutral. Uh, that's that's an area we're uh, working on a, a passive house uh, concept. How do you make, uh, let's say, if, if we think passive house is a great idea, then the question is: So, how many new homes can can be built that would use passive house concept? The answer is that maybe not a whole lot. But then, if the passive house criteria are good, why not applying them to existing homes? So, we're working on a project that one of our PhD students is looking into: How do you retrofit an existing home to make it near passive house? Okay. Uh, we are uh, working uh, several uh, research topics on 3D printing, <clears throat> 3D printing of uh, houses using concrete. <clears throat> That's one of the active areas I have. And uh, uh, because everybody else is doing that, they doing 3D printing of uh, homes using concrete. We say, OK, why don't we go beyond that and see if we can make it out of uh, maybe clay? So we're going to try uh, 3D print home out of clay and a straw. And uh, I just have a, a student who is interested in developing 3D printing of homes maybe for Africa. And so why not making it out of bamboo and also mm -hmm. maybe hemp? Because you can grow these materials in those areas very easily. So if you make the technology to 3D print these in, in remote areas, you just take your machines and, and you know uh, print it for them. Uh, that that means uh, we're uh, we're trying to come up with new methods of construction. Uh, the other area is uh, 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 modular construction, as we've talked about it, is a very active area, and there is a need actually for it. You know, there is a market for it. We say uh, if a research cannot find a builder or a manufacturer to actually scale it up. Then maybe uh, it's either too early or maybe it's just uh, not the right timing. Mm -hmm. uh, who's going to put the money for that? So we try to identify research areas where there is some interest out there that people are willing to put money for it and uh, and they want to actually use it in their operation. So uh, these are some, uh, I guess, examples. Uh, I guess another example that we're working on that I can mention is that uh, in search of uh, in search of making a concrete that uh, does not use as much cement. We have discovered many different ways of uh, substituting the cement with other materials like, uh, uh, you know, materials that come out of the uh, uh, factories that uh, are, are waste materials uh, that can be used instead of cement as a binder. We're working on uh, using recycled plastics uh, and melt them 
as a binder. So instead of instead of cement, we can actually use recycled plastic and, and uh, melted recycled plastic in the in the mixture. So there are uh, a lot of areas, and we explore uh, new new concepts, new areas, and hopefully, you know, one day uh, our our uh, the work of our students will uh, will be uh, commercialized. That's that's our mm -hmm. hope. That's very entrepreneurship, which is very exciting. Uh, one last question I have is now kind of going to the undergraduate level. What and uh, I don't know about you here at Purdue. We have some research at the undergraduate level, but it's main uh, it's mainly on the masters and the PhD. So for the our undergraduate viewers, uh, what do you see as benefits of getting involved in research projects at the undergraduate level, and how could they perhaps translate what they learn doing research at the undergraduate level to an industry career? So even even if they don't want to be researchers, yeah, that's that's a good question. And in fact, I have uh, several uh, undergraduate students working with me on research as well. So it's not okay. only graduate students. They uh, and this is part of uh, part of their. Uh, uh, I think it's a it's a trend that some students have discovered. So we have an honor program here at Penn State, uh, so Schreier Honor students. So uh, uh, I I usually have uh, one or two or three uh, Schreier Honor students each year that they want to do research. That's part of the requirement. Mm. Okay. So so then I try to give them uh, uh, some uh, some ideas. Uh, uh, and, and for instance, I'll give you one idea that uh, has has uh, been of great interest to some of them. Uh, so we talked about the uh, uh, the uh, mobile home mm -hmm. and stigma that mobile home has. Well, I have I had a graduate student who uh, has graduated now, has his own company, and uh, he's a home designer. Uh, one of the ideas that I gave him was that well, you know, people don't like the concept of a mobile home, but how about if we modernize that concept and make it uh, make it actually interesting for uh, structural engineers? So we call it a high-rise mobile home. We 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 kind of uh, <laughs> came up with the idea of a high-rise mobile home. This in the sense that um, you make a high-rise framing system, but then your mobile home can be plugged in mm. like a logo, like a Lego. You mm -hmm. plug it in. And so is, uh, think of a parking garage that you drive up and then you uh, you park in one corner. There are these parking garages where yeah. you actually lift your car yeah. and then push it in that slot. OK, so now we're saying that what well, we can do that with a home with a with a unit. So if that if your unit is your home and you're moving from one city to another city, we have this unit plugged into that building. I mean, we did call it the high rise mobile home, that concept. So I've had some students, a couple of actually undergraduate students. I let them kind of dream how they can come up with a concept because undergraduate students, they're not biased. So if I tell them that, think about this, they actually can come up with a really, really neat stuff. And so uh, that's one one area. Another one uh, has been uh, is working back on the hemp. Mm -hmm. So uh, the student uh, wants to know uh, what are what are the different uh, materials that we can make out of hemp for for home construction. Uh, uh, let's see some other ones that uh, they've they work on uh, uh, a concept like uh, if you have a home that is uh, near a shore mm -hmm. and uh, you get flooding or you get surge, right? You get surge, hurricane surge. You have no no way to escape, right? Your home is near the shore and flood is going to come and, and over, uh, overtake your home, right? Mm -hmm. So the concept that I gave this student, Shrier Honor student, was that can you turn this home into something that it would not get flooded? And the student said, well, I don't know. I can't, I can't think of it. I said, imagine you had a boat was sitting in sand. Right, the home was sitting in sand, and if this uh, surge come, would the boat get flooded? So no, the boat will just be there. So we then turn the existing home, put some walls around it, maybe about five six feet walls in the shape of uh, in the shape of a boat, 
And then when the storm surge comes in, basically it's just like a sunken ship on the ground and the water will just flow past by it and your mm. home does not get flooded. So again, these are new and kind of far-fetched ideas that undergraduate students can do actually a good job compared to graduate students because we don't have to worry about uh, a committee to <laughs> evaluate these things. <laughs> we just go, I let them go wild with their ideas, but then uh, technically they have to be sound. So uh, so yes, uh, undergraduate students, uh, I love the, the work that they do because I can give them uh, kind of uh, more difficult problems to think about and uh, kind of unconventional problems and solutions. That's great. So a lot of creativity involved. Yes. Okay, hey, very good. Uh, anything else you would like to share with our viewers? Well, uh, I guess we talked about research a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk, We can talk about a little bit about uh, uh, teaching as well. I mean, it's part of an education research, but then teaching is a cornerstone of, yep. uh, of learning. Uh, so we uh, offer several courses in residential construction uh, at, at Penn State. We kind of work around creating a minor minor in residential construction. That means with uh, 22 credits, 10 credits of uh, required courses and 12 credits of uh, uh, optional or electives, uh, we give students uh, a, a chance to get a, 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 a minor. We uh, also have a certificate, housing certificate with 12 credits. So, so those are, uh, um, uh, I guess, competing. Uh, uh the, they're not degrees but then uh, we call them minor i guess uh you know uh so a lot of uh, uh residential construction schools uh around the country have a department so most of them have a like a residential construction department we don't have a residential construction department we are part of civil engineering and architecture engineering but having the minor allows our students to uh, to get enough accumulated enough credit so that when they want to go in that area of uh, profession residential construction uh, they they basically grab them because they are ready to hit ground running and we've had uh, great examples and uh, Brian actually is much closer with with uh, a lot of the students who actually uh, uh, get into that area I want to give him a chance to chime in especially on the uh, the courses that we teach and uh, the minor yeah certainly I think some of the talking points that we went through or are, are um, resonating across the board. It's um, trying to get the industry to see long term that it's an investment in both research and it's also an investment in people and supporting the academic programs are just as important as supporting the research programs. So it's our goal to to leverage all those connections and uh, those opportunities to help our students succeed, just like so many other great schools who've been involved in the help program and uh, great schools are involved with NHB uh, do do time and time again. So um, our students are, are tend to focus more on engineering and design than than some other ones. But um, at the end of the day, like we said before, it's it's making sure we can get the industry to support it long term, play the long game there a bit and see it as as an ongoing investment of of energy and time and and, you know, being willing to bring them into their companies so that we continue to help this industry grow and evolve as we encounter the challenges that are going to be coming down the line in the next five, 10, 50 years. Yeah, Perfect. and then besides the uh, the teaching, uh, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, our residential construction program uh, doesn't stop just by offering courses. We want our students to have an opportunity to work on projects, real projects. So uh, we are participants in two national competitions, mm -hmm. NHB student chapter competition, where uh, they usually assign a, like a subdivision and uh, mm -hmm. You know, we, we we work with them to uh, to develop that subdivision, come up with the design and the typical homes. That's one competition that we've been uh, involved uh, for, uh, I guess, over, I don't know, 30 years. Uh, and then there's one solar decathlon that uh, mm -hmm. uh, started as Race to Zero. And again, yep. we were participants from the beginning, uh, working with Sam Rashkin uh, from DOE to kind of design the program. Uh, and we had input into the, uh, the components of this uh, competition. And so now it has uh, come down to uh, Solar Decathlon for design, where again, we have a team every year of our students, very popular. We offer uh, uh, a one credit course uh, that students uh, take in fall semester to prepare for the mm -hmm. NHB chapter competition and then one credit course 
for the DOE solo decathlon. And that, so the one credit course basically uh, provides the opportunity for students to come to the class every week. And then our instructors, including uh, Brian, uh, they basically uh, provide the guidance to them uh, because uh, uh, we, we figured that uh, the best way to, to coach these students is, uh, is bring somebody who has actually been out there design homes. And Brian is an example of that. So that means uh, our, our coaches are people who actually have been home designers. Mm -hmm. So we figured that they are much better suited to teach them home design than I that just, just do, does research in laboratory. You know, most of my work is laboratory work. Uh, or, or simulation. So, so we try to uh, get get help from the professionals and put them work with the students so that they can coach them. And so, at the end, students get a lot more, learn a lot more out of the competitions than just taking a, a conventional course. Perfect. I love the way that you describe because we always think of residential construction as low tech, but just hearing about all these new technologies, I think we can see that things are changing pretty rapidly. Yeah, actually, you know, to you're right. I mean, I have, uh, I would say about nine PhD students, just just the PhD students wor working on different areas of this residential construction research, the topics that we've discussed, and about uh, five or six master's students. So uh, I, I think uh, we just have to uh, go a little bit beyond the norm and think out of the box and be persistent. I mean, these things do not come about easy. You have to invest a lot of time and effort mm -hmm. uh, until you you build teams that uh, will bring different expertise together. And of course, the result will be good. Sounds very much like a construction company. <laughs> <laughs> it is. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Brian. Thank you very much, Dr. Mimari.